Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for coming today. This is our talk on the principles for package repository security framework. Uh, we'll kick things off with some introductions. I'm Jack Cable. I'm a senior technical advisor at CISA. That's the cybersecurity and infrastructure security agency. And uh, we're the US government agency who's focused on um, cyber defense. So we help protect the federal government and critical infrastructure. Um, and at CISA, I help lead our work on open source software security as well as secure by design. Um, and for the purposes of this talk, I um, also happen to be a co-author with Zach of the Principles for Package Repository Security Framework, which we'll get into shortly. Yeah, and my name is uh, Zach Steinler. My day job is at GitHub. So it's the focus is all uh, supply chain security, but it's sort of 50-50 with our open source users on GitHub and then also with our enterprise uh, customers on GitHub. Uh, like Jack mentioned, we wrote the document together. Uh, and then uh, the other hat that I'm wearing for this presentation is a uh, co-chair of the OpenSSF uh, Securing Software Repositories Working Group, uh, where this work was uh, homed. Uh, and if you're interested in this topic generally, uh, there's quite a bit of content that this working group is, is putting out. So we'll have some uh, links towards the end of the presentation with more context there. Uh, okay, so there's there's a couple of different parties here. So let's talk first from the perspective of the OpenSSF uh, Working Group. It will probably not surprise the people in this room to learn that uh, open source package repositories like NPM, Rust Crates, Ruby Gems are incredibly juicy targets for attackers. It's an easy way for them to host malicious content. And of course, if they can take over an existing package or if they can convince someone to use their package, maybe via typo squatting, you can very quickly get your malware distributed to thousands, maybe even millions of downstream consumers. Even worse, the attackers are uh, quite clever, and so they will sort of prove out techniques and procedures uh, in attacking one ecosystem, and then when that ecosystem implements countermeasures, they pivot and they go to the next one, and they run the same playbook. Again, just sort of maximizing damage, uh, whatever their target is here, if it's you know cryptocurrency, uh, havoc, political statements. We've seen almost every motivation here for uh, bad actors. So the thesis of the working group is, can we take a page from the attackers and can we bring the package repositories together and do what they did? So just as they're sharing uh, techniques uh, and applying them from one ecosystem to another, we're taking the lessons learned from defending these ecosystems uh, and sharing them across uh, different uh, package repositories. Uh, this may sound very formal. Uh, in practice, there's a OpenSSF Slack channel where there's ongoing discussion. And then we meet roughly every two weeks uh, to talk about what sort of uh, security defenses are in our ecosystems, uh, what's working, what's not working. Uh, a great example here is, let's say, a, a smaller, relatively new ecosystem wants to start writing a policy for how to handle account uh, uh, recovery procedures. Like, how do you, what sort of information do you ask someone for to prove that they own an account? Instead of us each starting from uh, square one and inventing this from scratch, we can take what we've learned from uh, PyPI or NPM, which receive you know, hundreds and thousands of these requests over any given time period, uh, and give that information to other ecosystems so that they can start from that level instead of having to uh, start from square one. There's a few important things, I guess, to note about the working group. Uh, it is opt-in and uh, everyone is sort of volunteering their time. And so this is true across all of open source, but particularly for a OpenSSF working group, we really want to be respectful of what we're asking people to do because a lot of these package repositories are part of nonprofits and are very constrained either in terms of their financial resources or even their time available to uh, address security concerns. Uh, and then the second important point is that we are setting recommendations, not requirements. Uh, we are uh, not ordering people to follow some new standard, uh, but the goal here is to, again, share those learnings and uh, not to force people to do any specific uh, activity to secure their ecosystem. Great. Um, so, so 
Um, you, you might be wondering, Kev, what is the, the U.S. government's interest in this? Um, and it's important to note that, to my knowledge at least, this is the, the first time CISA has worked with an open source um, um, SF um, working group and potentially even the first time um, a, a U.S. government agency, any agency, ha has worked with a, a working group uh, to, to put out a product like this. Um, and, and really what this comes down to is from our perspective at CISA, where we're charged with protecting both the federal civilian government as well as critical infrastructure, so everything from hospitals to schools to water systems and so on, everything we, we rely on for our daily lives. Um, and, and we know that vulnerabilities like Log4j have highlighted uh, the, the real uh, threat posed by either attacks um, uh, leveraging vulnerabilities in widely used open source repositories or like with XZ, uh, malicious compromise of um, upstream dependencies. Um, so, so really our goal at CISA is to see how we can help enable a, a more secure open source ecosystem that benefits us all and, and that we can continue uh, getting all of the, the value we do out of open source. Uh, so last September, we put out our open source software security roadmap. Um, this is in line with the White House's national cybersecurity strategy, which talks about long-term uh, security improvements to um, help uh, secure the open source ecosystem. Um, and one of the items that we identified in this roadmap was around uh, precisely how we can collaborate with package repositories to help secure the, the open source ecosystem. And, and I'll just note to um, some of what Zach was talking about earlier that uh, package repositories are a really critical point because basically everyone uses them to access to use open source code um, and they have an incredible ability to scale out security improvements across open source ecosystems. Uh, but at the same time, we know these package repositories are themselves under-resourced. Uh, many of them are operated by nonprofits or otherwise are operated by companies, not as a profit center, but really as a kind of public service uh, to, to everyone who relies on that. Um, so how can we as CISA, as the government, help uh, both kind of standardize around what security best practices should be taken by package repositories, and then how can we help uh, facilitate adoption um, has really been our goal here. Okay, so what's actually in this framework and uh, what, what does it do? Uh, well, at the end of the day, what it really is, is it's a maturity model for package repositories around security. Um, so if people are familiar with Salsa, for instance, we, we took a similar approach where we laid out uh, four levels of security maturity for package repositories, ranging from no security maturity to very advanced security maturity. And then we outline uh, capabilities in line with that that we think package repository should be working to. Um, and in the, the spirit of this working group, we built this out iteratively with the input of package repositories. So we don't want to have something that just was created in a vacuum, isn't applicable to anyone, uh, but really it gets towards um, some of the unique considerations for each ecosystem. Um, and to that effect, one of the aspects we included is a taxonomy of various capabilities that package repositories have. Uh, because we know there there is a, a diverse range of um, types of package repositories. Some have user accounts and they have um, role-based access control for uh, packages and so on, and they have security considerations around that. Others might not even have accounts at all and instead just uh, mirror code uh, from source control uh, repositories. So uh, from our perspective, we wanted to create something that any packed repository, any ecosystem could adapt and, and get value from. Um, and this is still a work in progress. We've put out v0.1, working on v0.2. Uh, but, but the hope is that we can uh, create something that um, actually does uh, provide value and that, that package repositories can start adapting and working towards. Yeah, thanks. The comparison to Salsa is an interesting one because it it has levels, of course, but at the same time, the audience is quite different where anyone who's developing or building software, which I suspect is a lot of us, could make use of Salsa. This is really targeted at people who uh, maintain and operate these package repositories. And there's two specific things that we want them to do with this document. 
so like I was saying before, we're trying to avoid uh, starting from uh, scratch. And so the first thing that we're hoping they do is they take this information and they use it to build a security roadmap. Uh, it is quite uh, time consuming to create a threat model. Uh, it is, you know, uh, an involved process to uh, work with the uh, community to uh, gather different concerns, uh, evaluate that against the threat model, you know, propose solutions. And we're not at all suggesting here to short circuit that community process, but rather instead of having to start from a blank page, you know, you have a you have a list of recommendations that you can sort of choose to adapt as you uh, see fit. Uh, and then the second way we hope people to use this uh, is another hot topic, uh, funding. So because these package repositories are often uh, under-resourced, uh, they are applying externally for uh, funding in order to um, help accelerate their security capabilities that they're uh, implementing. Uh, there's some really cool trends that are uh, happening here. Uh, so think of things like the Open Technology Fund, or the Sovereign Tech Fund, or Open SSF, Open SSF Alpha Omega. Uh, these are uh, groups that have started funding security capabilities in these package repositories in the past couple of years that uh, where this was not happening five years ago. Uh, and, and five years ago as well, when there were sort of like these one-off uh, funds from individual foundations, they would often target like one specific security capability. Some of these more recent funders are funding security in residence roles where over a year or over the course of a handful of years, suites of security capabilities are being implemented. So, you know, we're not done with security, uh, but it is kind of a exciting time uh, in the world of package repositories because we've seen the velocity of security capabilities landing uh, really increase from these funding sources. Uh, and then, of course, having this as a, uh, you know, recommendation uh, between CISA and uh, the OpenSSF we think will make it easier for individual packed repositories to fill out these funding requests and say, this isn't something we just made up. You know, you can see here how this is uh, something that is uh, a standard across multiple ecosystems. It has been vetted out, that sort of thing. Great, so, so what's actually in this? Um, well, um, so we have four different buckets that we laid out around authentication, authorization, general capabilities, and CLI tooling. Um, I'll talk a bit about each of these and then dive a bit more into um, authentication specifically just so people can get a sense of how this is structured uh, for the sake of time. I won't get into everything that's in here, but of course you're uh, welcome and encouraged to uh, check out uh, the, the framework itself, which we'll link at the end. Um, so starting with authentication, uh, the goal here is to lay out how uh, package repositories can most effectively um, authenticate users in a way that uh, makes them resistant to account takeover attacks, whether phishing, credential stuffing, or, or the like. Um, so we uh, talk a lot about um, multi-factor authentication, and as you'll see shortly, have kind of a hierarchy of actions around uh, multi-factor authentication that uh, we encourage package repositories to take. This also includes items like having um, an account recovery policy where uh, we know that maintainers might get locked out of their accounts um, and need to, to figure out a way to both uh, make sure that when that happens, maintainers have a way of getting into their accounts without, of course, exposing that as a way for attackers to uh, compromise a maintainer's account. Um, around authorization, we include areas like having uh, role-based access control for um, packages um, so that uh, maintainers can kind of delegate permissions. Uh, we also include aspects of having scoped API keys so that if a key does get compromised, it can be scoped to specific packages and not the, the maintainer's whole account. Um, around general capabilities, we include items like having a uh, vulnerability disclosure policy published um, so that security researchers can test for and report vulnerabilities in the packages, um, in, in the package repositories infrastructure itself. Uh, we also include um, items around doing regular security assessments of the, the repository, as well as actions to prevent typo squatting attacks, which we know are one of the more pervasive sorts of attacks that, that face um, package repositories, and whether it's looking for uh, packages that come up with similar names or other techniques that we've seen uh, many ecosystems effectively use, it's an area uh, where uh, encouraging package repositories to take 
take more steps. And then lastly is the area of CLI tooling. How can package repositories make sure that all of these security benefits um, actually get towards the, the end users, the developers who are um, using their um, uh, command line interfaces and um, pulling down packages. Um, so whether that's capabilities to generate um, software build materials, SBOM for instance, whether it's um, for instance some ecosystems we've seen approaches to um, actually uh, look for using kind of stack analysis techniques to see if um, a um, user is actually affected by a vulnerability uh, based on kind of what code paths are invoked. Uh, we've seen that, uh, I believe, in, in Rust and Go. Um, so aspects like that that can kind of reduce some of that burden on developers in addition to uh, warning of uh, known vulnerabilities so that developers can, can be aware if they're um, in installing a package that does have vulnerabilities. To get into um, authentication in a little more detail, um, here I've laid out kind of um, a high level summary of, of what that hierarchy looks like in our framework. Um, so at the very bottom, kind of, and what's not pictured here is level zero, which is doing nothing here. Um, we, we hope that uh, package repositories are at least uh, doing a bit more. Um, but for instance, uh, level one is at the very least uh, supporting multi-factor authentication so that maintainers can enable that if they wish. Um, also having a documented account recovery policy, like I mentioned. Uh, level two, going a bit further, is actually starting to require MFA for maintainers of packages deemed critical. That might be based on, for instance, level of usage um, and so on. Um, and we've seen many um, ecosystems already start to do this, um, in addition to supporting phishing resistant MFA, so security keys or pass keys, um, the, the most secure form of MFA that we know can uh, prevent phishing attacks and help um, against account takeovers. And then at the highest level, um, the, the language is around requiring MFA for all packages um, and even going a step further for those critical packages requiring phishing resistant MFA. Um, and, and then um, we've, we've saw, seen some ecosystems even go above and beyond this, for instance, sending out free security keys to maintainers. Um, actions like that are, are very much welcomed as well. Yes, so what did we learn? Uh, it's really easy in security, especially when you are on the defensive side, to be very cynical. Uh, so I would say by and large, this was a very successful exercise. We received a lot of great feedback from various uh, package repositories that helped us refine the model and ensure that it covered the breadth of ecosystems we wanted to represent. But there's definitely things that we are doing differently for uh, V02. Uh, and so the first area I wanted to talk about was framing. Uh, these are maybe a combination of things that uh, we'll all have experienced from any technical project but are maybe additionally crucial when you talk about collaborations, uh, either with the public sector and the private sector or with the open source ecosystems generally. So it's really important when you're starting a project to have a clear definition of what your goals are, what's in scope, what's out of scope, you know, sort of your rules of engagement. Uh, we did not do a great job of that uh, with uh, V01. Uh, it is, I added it to V02 right before uh, this conference. Uh, but examples of this uh, would be things like ensuring that security capabilities have landed in at least one ecosystem. Uh, research is great, but the point of these recommendations are to collect things that have sort of been uh, tested in production at scale. And so we didn't want um, a open-ended brainstorm, but more of a narrow focused list uh, to that end, another rule of engagement we came up with was, uh, you know, these are things that are supposed to be forward-looking. Uh, again, like we talked about, the purpose is to help plan out security roadmaps, to help plan out funding requests. So we got a really great question, which was like, should TLS be on this list? Should I be using HTTPS? And the answer is yes, it's 2024. You should be using HTTPS. Please don't make me tell you you should be using HTTPS. Uh, we, we take some things for granted in this. It's not a uh, comprehensive overview of every security capability that you should have. Uh, and then, oh, and then I think that maturity models in general are kind of a cheat code for security. It's a really great way to make progress towards security goals without requiring things be perfect from day one. Uh, and having done a few of these maturity models now, either in uh, private sector or more publicly, there, in particular, it's really helpful to focus on capabilities instead of implementation details. 
So one of our capabilities that I'm really excited about is uh, protecting the integrity of the package index, which is kind of a mouthful. But the idea here is if your package repository just has a relational database saying what's in each version, it's very easy for an attacker to modify that information. Uh, there's a number of efforts underway, some fully deployed, like the Go ecosystem has their uh, you know, checksum that's part of the uh, module system. Uh, and then uh, NPM provenance, uh, or sorry, the NPM ecosystem is experimenting with uh, published attestations and uh, RubyGems is experimenting with RSTuf. So these are three different implementations for the same capability. That's great. We're not trying to get everyone to do the same thing. Uh, and if we prescribed a specific implementation that was later found to have flaws or a better implementation came along, we'd have to go back and update the model. So we really wanted to focus on capabilities uh, first and maybe give some examples of implementation, but not require specific implementations in the model. We uh, wrote these down, as I mentioned. Uh, this is really valuable because as the project went along, new people joined it. Uh, and for them to contribute and get up to speed quickly, it's helpful for them to also have these rules of engagements. Uh, while I'm talking about writing things down, uh, it turns out that words are very slippery things uh, and definitions are very important. It even took us a while to land on the terminology package repositories. Uh, every ecosystem has slightly different ways of referring to the different components that make it up. Uh, and again, that's okay. For the purposes of the document, though, it needs to use words in a consistent way to be coherent. Uh, and so uh, one of the things that we still need to do in V02 is take the definitions that we landed on in V01 and add that to some sort of glossary. Again, as people join the project later on, it's really helpful for this information to exist so they can quickly come up to speed and contribute to the project. Uh, and I mean, really, the whole theme of this slide is like, things we probably already know from working on technical projects, but the last one is time. Uh, all projects run behind, but in particular, when you're talking about collaborating with multiple entities uh, outside of your organizational boundary, you really wanna make sure that you're giving uh, enough time to allow people to give feedback, to iterate on that feedback, and then you know even get multiple rounds of it. Uh, because many of the people participating in this were volunteers, uh, things might come up in their personal life or in work, and so it's a really good idea to ensure you're leaving ample time, especially if you're up against external deadlines like funding rounds or conferences. Great. Um, so where are we going next with this? So, so I'll talk a bit and then we'll, we'll get into um, questions if anyone has them. Um, so about a month ago at CISA, we held our uh, first open source uh, software security summit where we invited uh, many uh, from the open source community, from nonprofits, from package repositories, from, from companies uh, to uh, come and collaborate around a number of areas. And one of those was around uh, the security of package repositories. Uh, one announcement coming out of that summit was uh, we um, worked with uh, five prominent package repositories, NPM, uh, PyPy, um, I just put myself on the spot to remember all five, um, Maven Central, um, PHP Composer, as well as um, NPM, PyPy. I'm gonna feel bad if I forget one, so. Um, I'll say that when I when it comes to me, but um, so so we highlighted how they're working to um, take steps in line with the principles for package repository security framework, um, and um, Rust was the other one. There you go. Um, so so um, we want to work with package repositories to facilitate the voluntary adoption of this, and we we've had a number of good conversations following then. Um, that uh, it seems like this has been beneficial to them to lay out uh, what their approach looks like, what steps they should be taking. Um, so we're encouraged by that. Um, and then more broadly, um, as Zach mentioned, we've started working on v0.2. Uh, we have an open pull request. Uh, you can see here on the GitHub, which is linked from uh, the, the principles document, which I'll um, share um, in a bit. Uh, but really, we want to get feedback from people here. We want to get feedback from more package repositories. 
Um, we, we've probably engaged, I don't know, about 10 or so so far, but, but want to uh, keep expanding that further. Um, and we want to see how we can both uh, continue refining the language to make sure it's applicable, to make sure that it um, is something that can be adaptable to different ecosystems, um, and, and most importantly, that it's adoptable and that we can start to, to see real security improvements from, stemming from it. Um, and, and with that, I'll leave the link to our framework. Thank you, everyone, for coming to the talk. Great. Uh, we've got a bunch of time for questions, so anyone want to kick things off? Yep. Yes. Uh, so there's a wealth of information contained within this uh, URL. Uh, my URL taxonomy is going to fail me, but if you go to repos.opensf.org, that's sort of a landing page for all the recommendations that the working group has published. There's also a link to the GitHub repository, and the readme in the GitHub repository has the meeting information. Um, we try to alternate uh, times, so there's one that's more... Uh, uh, like a uh, European, African uh, time zone friendly. And there's one that's more US, like Pacific Coast time friendly. Um, and then th we meet uh, every other week. So roughly once a month in each of those time zones. Yes, and I forgot, I should probably be repeating the question. So the question was, uh, are we going to take package repositories and uh, stand them up next to this meter stick uh, and uh, see uh, where they're at? It's an interesting question. Uh, the working group is doing a related but slightly different effort where we are going through the change log for package repositories for the past 12 months and looking at what security capabilities have landed, who funded them, and I see some funders in the room, uh, and using that to help people give an I to give people an idea about where we're headed on the security journey. Um, there, and so that also includes not just twelve months looking back, but also security capabilities that are planned to land in the next twelve months. So far, we haven't cross-referenced that uh, with this. Uh, principles for package repository security. Um, I think if, it w if, if the package repositories told us that it would help, we would. I have not yet received that feedback from them. Yep, and, and I'd say that's the core part, where, where of course, the, the goal of this at the end of the day is to see how we can best support uh, package repositories in kind of raising the, the tide of security. Um, so for, for instance, I, I could see us um, working with package repositories um, collaboratively around developing their uh, security capabilities roadmap more and, and seeing how we can kind of help provide input into what goes into that based on the framework. And then um, hopefully that can serve as kind of uh, eventually maybe a shared place where funders can go to say, okay, if I want to kind of help secure package repositories broadly, where can I um, kind of spend money most cost effectively? Um, so I think we um, are eager to, to explore um, areas where we can kind of collaborate more with um, package repositories to, to help plan out their efforts. Don't necessarily want to, to name and shame because, again, these are, um, as we, we know, under-resourced entities, and we want to, to see how we can help them um, move further along. It's an interesting question. So the question is, have we considered including funding as a vertical in the model? Um, I would say that at, at least, and interesting hearing what, what Zach thinks, but I view funding as kind of a input and a facilitator that can help package repositories um, better mature along the lines of the framework um, and, of course, um, can, can kind of help them get there. I don't know if I'd view kind of funding itself as a kind of security capability, even though it's of, of course correlated, but I would say kind of we 
want to kind of the items in here are of course um, many or most of them need funding in order to, to make them happen. Yeah, and the even the even within the conversation of funding, there's so many different dimensions. If you're if you're talking about like the operational spec, uh, expense of running the service, if you're talking about uh, being able to deliver on the roadmap more quickly, if you're talking about uh, needing additional staff to perform additional functions, um, I think that the the principles document itself is more focused on. I guess I would call them sort of like technical security capabilities and less of sort of like a general purpose operational model. Um, that said, funding is absolutely a hot topic, as we've mentioned. Um, and uh, as, we are, as we are identifying uh, security capabilities landing in these different ecosystems, when there's information publicly available about how that work is funded, we are including that information uh, in terms of the the work that the OpenSSF working group is doing, um, kind of in parallel to the principles for package repository security document. Yes. So the, the question was around um, analyzing uh, risk of package repositories in terms of uh, business continuity as one as one possible term. Yeah, and maybe one distinction that I think might help is when we say package repository, and we probably should have said this at the, the top, but what we're referring to is the entities, the, the package managers, the NPMs, pipes of the world who operate these platforms by which open source code is distributed. Um, and, and kind of separate from individual packages hosted on those repositories uh, for which if I'm an organization using those packages, certainly I might want to, to look into um, those sorts of things. But, but this framework is specifically geared towards, okay, what actions are these kind of repositories, these platforms themselves taking, which, which can help scale security improvements across the ecosystem. Cool. Um, other questions, comments? Concerns. Yeah. So, so if I'm understanding your question, is it like how can a package repository, their tooling, make it easier for end users to update um, kind of their packages, their dependencies? Is that where you're heading? Yeah. Um, so. Yes, uh, I think uh, some of that is actually uh, covered in the framework. So, uh, do read it. Uh, but the, one of the one of the pillars was the the CLI tooling. And one of the capabilities there is the CLI tooling let you, letting you know if you are installing a library uh, that has known vulnerabilities. Maybe you're performing security research. There, there could be a variety of reasons why you desire that. But the CLI is going to let you know, hey, you know, here's additional context that might be helpful for you if you're producing uh, an end product that you want to be free of security vulnerabilities. So I think I think in that in that way this framework could help support that. Certainly, we the the problem statement of uh, how does vulnerability management work across all of open source is a little bit outside the scope of our document. <laughs> Do you have a question?
yes. So the the question slash comment was around uh, how uh, inside of the DoD they have a uh, package repository system that has some additional uh, capabilities to do automatic patching, uh, especially in circumstances where, where it's very unlikely to sort of uh, break the, the packages or the downstream consumers, and if the open source package repositories can do such a thing. I think the, the short answer is that is a really promising avenue for research. I don't know of that capability existing today in open source package repositories. They definitely have a different contract with their customers. Uh, and so I think I think that could be interesting to see if if that technique developed could be applied to a open source packed repository. If it is successfully, then we'll include it in the principles document. Gotcha. Yeah. So the the comment was around um, uh, including metadata with package distribution around uh, some sort of concept of, of of riskiness, perhaps, and then consumers who are using this in like long lived infrastructure applications versus uh, you know uh, learn projects where they're sort of like learning open source could could make independent sort of like risk assessments about what dependencies might be appropriate for them to consume. Yeah, and of course, part of the challenge is that there today isn't much ability for choice, since most often it's okay here if you're working within this programming language. Then here's the the package repository you you can use, um, and kind of the, the, the many ecosystems there, there. There's just one main one, um, so I, I think that that can be an open area to explore, and hopefully, as ecosystems explore. Um, maybe there is more ability to to kind of evaluate based on that. Um, anything to add? No, let's stick around. But I think yeah, might be great. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone. I think we're about time, but uh, thank you for coming.